Okay, welcome everyone to this edition of Map Time Davis. My name is Michelle Tobias, and I am the Geospatial Data Specialist at UC Davis Data Lab. Um, today, we have a bit of a change of plans. Originally, we had planned on having Clancy McConnell come and talk to us about using drones for research and getting started with drones for academic research, but he is doing his civic duty on jury duty currently. <laughs> so we're gonna reschedule him for next quarter. Um, and I figured um, in lieu of that talk, I would go ahead and just do a quick, um, a quick pivot and we'll talk about kite aerial photography today um, and also the workflow around that that I particularly use. Um, all of this is very different to what Clancy's workflow is. So um, when we get that rescheduled, I encourage everyone to attend that talk as well because there is not going to be a ton of overlap because he's using drones and um, a different photo processing workflow. So um, but for those of you who are like, I really need to find out things about um, doing my own aerial photography. Um, we figured since I could give this talk, we'd go ahead and do that um, and kind of fill the gap in the meantime. So um, feel free to ask questions about drones and things like that, as well as kites um, between me and a couple of the other folks who I know are on the call that have some expertise with those things. We can probably get you answers if you're um, chomping at the bit for, for drone stuff specifically. But um, so that's the plan for today. Um, I can jump into material here if I can find my um, window that I need. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so I have tabs. We are gonna go through stuff. Um, oh shoot, let me stop sharing. I need to fix something in the share. Um, I don't usually need audio, so. Okay, um, so we should be good. Um, sorry, this is not as smooth as it normally is because this is kind of an impromptu um, impromptu session. Leave the chat up. Okay. All right, now I am set up. Apologies for the behind the scenes uh, I'm talking to myself. So what I wanted to do is show you. Can someone give me a thumbs up and tell me if you can see my um, my uh, screen that has the YouTube up? Okay, thanks. Um, Zoom stuff, I think Zoom update and things look a little different than I'm used to, which is pretty normal. Give a workshop and get something new. Um, so I just wanna show you a quick little video that um, I put together a long time ago for a similar talk. And I think this is pretty fun. All right. Um, so that is um, just a quick little video that I put together um, as a kind of teaser video for um, a conference that I was going to and the, the slides for today are going to come from uh, that talk as well. Um, sorry, it, Zoom decided to not have my little video box and it's concerning me, but I think I can get along without it. Um, so um, anyway, the idea of that video is to kind of show you how this kite system works a little bit, um, show you how the air photos come together um, uh, and just be kind of fun. So hopefully that was a little, little bit of fun to watch. Um, and anyway, I don't know why it's bugging me so much that little preview thing isn't there. That's okay. Um, <laughs> So um, you're showing the whole uh, screen instead of just one app. Yeah, that's normal. Um, anyway, that's okay. Let me let me try again. 
I normally just share this screen. Screen one, share. Nope, it's just, I think Zoom changed something. It's fine. I will live. Someone just tell me if things look weird and I'll be okay. Um, okay, so anyway, um, my issues with Zoom aside today, um, kites, why are we doing kites um, instead of drones? Um, I think these days drones are pretty um, common. I think you hear about that quite a bit um, just because they're, for a while they've been sort of the hot topic, but they've also been fairly accessible. Um, but the thing is kite aerial photography has been around for pretty much since the advent of cameras, um, which sounds maybe a little bit strange when you think about what original cameras look like, but there um, are examples of aerial photography of like the, um, the fire in San Francisco that were taken with cameras on box kites. So this has been around for a, a while. Um, and you might also think like, this is a bad idea putting a camera on a kite. Isn't it going to crash? And that's honestly what I thought when I started um, doing this. Uh, I actually started working with uh, a balloon system. Um, in, in my case, it was a hot air balloon system. Um, and it was not a great choice, but it was really stable. And it um, once it got up in the air, but it was not very safe because it has an open flame. So um, I started thinking about like, well, maybe kites aren't such a bad idea. Um, and once I got into it, I realized that kites are actually um, much more stable than I expected them to be. So that is, uh, I think, something to take away from this is that this is possible, even though it maybe sounds a little bit um, illogical, putting something heavy like a camera on a kite, um, how is this pos possibly going to work? But kites are good for certain things. They're not good for other things. One of the things kites are really good at, you might suspect, is windy places. So my particular research, my dissertation research, and um, the stuff that I'm still interested in is the California coast, in particular dune vegetation and sandy beach vegetation. So kites are great on the California coast. There's a lot of wind. <laughs> so um, that's a good system to use a kite in. In fact, sometimes it's better for kites than drones um, because of the wind, but also because um, drones um, can irritate people just because of their sound. Um, that buzzing sound annoys people. And then they also realize it's a drone above them and they're kind of concerned about that. But I find people on beaches really are not concerned about kites. Um, they're often brightly colored. They're also used to seeing kites on beaches because they're windy. So um, it doesn't really bother people and they're quiet. They don't make a lot of noise. So people generally tolerate kites pretty well um, in their vicinity. Not that you wanna fly with a lot of people around, but um, if there's a few people around your kite is, um, you can handle that safely. And also you're not gonna bother people. Kites are awfully, also remarkably hard to break. I'm going to show you one kite that doesn't even have spars, so it's it's pretty difficult to break that because it's just made of fabric. Um, and also, kites are a lot less expensive than drones to get started with. So, um, if you're working in a windy place um, and you have the space to fly it, um, kites might be a really good alternative to a drone system. Um, so, just something to keep in mind: kites are not good for everything, the same way drones are not good for everything. So um, there is a time and place for, for different systems. So today we're gonna talk about what this kite aerial photography system actually looks like. Um, I've got my phone set up to show you video of some of the equipment that I've got um, so you can see it live and kind of see what some of the updated stuff is. But like I mentioned before, these slides are from a much older talk. Um, so some of the equipment that I have pictures of is is not as up to date as the equipment in the actual research box. Um, and then once we get through that, um, I'll show you my photo processing workflow that uses open drone map. So you can get an idea of um, how that works. Um, we're not going to set up open drone map today as like a workshop kind of situation. Um, but if you have questions, come see me in data lab drop in hours and we can probably I can probably help you get started with that. Um, it's not it's not hard to use, it's just tricky to set up, um, but I'll, I'll show you some of that. Um, so if you're um, interested in getting started with that, you might be able to do that after this workshop, or at least be able to ask the right questions. Okay, so again, 
equipment setup, and then photo processing is the plan. Okay, so how does this whole thing work? You're probably thinking like, like me originally, putting a kite on a camera is a really stupid idea. Isn't it going to pull the kite down? Isn't it going to be too heavy? Um, and the answer to that is yes, if you get the wrong equipment and you try to put too heavy a camera on it, of course it won't fly. But um, if you spec things correctly, this does work. Um, the things that you generally need to make this happen is a kite. Obviously it's kite aerial photography. Um, the thing that you will not need is the um, kind of kite that I'm showing on the screen right now. Uh, so this kind of like uh, diamond shaped kite, when you think of kites, the kind you flew as a kid is not going to work. This isn't meant for lifting, but for diagram purposes, it's easier to understand. So that's why I'm using that. Um, I'll show you what some of the appropriate kites look like. Um, the other thing you're going to need is a tail on your kite. Um, tails actually aren't just for looks, they're for helping with uh, kite stability. So I'll show you kind of what that looks like as well. Um, I might even be able to dig one out of the box behind me that you can't see yet. Um, and show you what that looks like. Um, not only are they good for stability, they're also super fun because they can be colorful and, and things like that. So uh, extra bonus. Um, you're also going to need a line uh, that attaches to your kite. Obviously, you're, you're used to seeing that, right? Like kites fly on a string. Um, so we'll talk about what that line might look like. Um, and then you attach your camera, not to the not to the kite itself which is what i thought originally like how do you attach a camera to a fabric kite you actually attach it to the line which surprised me when i was learning how to do this um, so we attach the camera actually also not directly to the line but to a system called a peak event which i'll show you what that looks like too um, but so it's this kind of pulley system that keeps the camera nice and level so that when the line changes angles as the kite flies that kind of you know moves up and down in the sky um, your camera stays level and doesn't change to the same angle as the line um, so that's a, a neat system that is helpful for keeping your photos nader or whatever angle it is you chose to fly um, at so that's the general outline of the system um, it's fairly straightforward but obviously like so many things there are a lot of details to each and every piece of this so if you're going to get started with this just have patience because it, it will take some time to make sure you get um get everything situated and um getting all the right pieces together and sometimes it's iterative <laughs> just like research um I see Alex mentions in the chat, um, feel free to post questions in the chat um, and or you can unmute and ask them verbally too. I'm fine with that. Okay, so in terms of equipment, I think the best place to get started is with the kite um, part of this. I have two kites that I have in my um, in my uh, box of kite aerial photography equipment. So um, I have two different kites that have kind of two different purposes. Um, the first one that I got is, um, this is the older one in my kit, is a, a kite called a parafoil. Um, and this kite, like I mentioned before, this one has no spars in it. So it doesn't have the like the sticks that you think of inside of a kite. It is entirely made of fabric. Um, and it kind of works a little bit like a box kite where it has, um, it the air goes into um, inside the kite, like in this case, it has um, a bunch of tubes and you might be able to see kind of in this picture. Um, it's almost like a honeycomb, like tubes of fabric lined up next to each other. Um, and so that provides more surface area for um, the wind to catch. And so it has more lifting surface, which makes it able to lift um, fairly heavy weights. I can actually lift with this kite on a really windy day. One time we were able to get both um, digital SLRs up with this one, but normally it can only lift one. Um, but so this kite is designed to actually lift weight. Um, this Normally these um, kinds of kites are sold for um, a hobby which involves putting fancy wind socks on the line. Um, uh, and they call it um, line laundry. Um, if you look at places that sell um, uh, 
expensive kites, you'll find this, this concept called line laundry, where essentially it's a fancy windsock. They might spin around. They might be shaped like different things like dragons or fish or um, all kinds of different stuff. Um, so this kite is designed to lift those things into the air and you attach those along the line and then they do their thing in the sky and they're pretty and they're fun. Um, so Alex mentions in the chat that um, the, the cameras I was talking about uh, weigh about six pounds. So that's quite a large payload <laughs> for something that you think of as not um, being kind of fragile, but this kite is definitely not fragile. It's intended for lifting that kind of weight. Um, so this is, that's the parafoil. It, um, it does require a tail. Um, I found out the hard way. So this um, particular design um, was originally marketed as not needing a tail, um, but Fortunately, it comes with three different places you can attach a tail because it actually needs one, especially when it has a lot of weight on the line. It tends to go up in the sky and you want a kite that stays stable and doesn't really move around a lot. But this kite, when it has weight on it, gets up there and starts waving back and forth <laughs> a little and um, having a tail on it helps stabilize that so it doesn't move so much um, because when it is swishing back and forth in the air um, it's moving the line as well and so what that does is the camera starts swinging back and forth and that one gets bad air photos because you're taking pictures of things you know you weren't intending to like the horizon um, but also it starts making the kite even more unstable so it kind of um, just makes things uh, move around too much I guess in the air. So um, in this picture, you might be able to see a little bit, there's this little black dot, and that's actually a, a kind of tail called a drogue tail. It looks like a, um, kind of looks like a bucket with the top and bottom cut off. Um, it's kind of wedge shaped, but, uh, or like a windsock, if you've ever seen like a windsock at, a, um, at an airfield. Um, and it, the point of that is to provide drag so that it um, puts a little bit more weight on the end of the kite and keeps it stable. And then you might also be able to see this little white dot. Um, that's actually the camera housing. So the line kind of goes to this point and then changes angle up to the, the kite itself. And so the cameras are actually inside that white thing, um, which is a actually a um, plastic trash can that I got at the SPCA thrift store. And we put the cameras inside it to keep them safe. Um, so that's the parafoil. It's, it's definitely designed to lift um, and here's a picture of it with um, a kind of tail on it called a fuzzy tail. And this inset picture is a picture of it, the fuzzy tail on the floor. So it's a, a string essentially with um, ripstop nylon attached to it that we've cut into strips. And this one's homemade, but you can buy these as well. Um, it was a little cheaper to make it myself. So um, went to Joann's. And then when they ask you why you're cutting all of this rainbow fabric, they're expecting you to say, oh, I'm making a costume for my chihuahua. But it turns out I was like, oh, I'm making kite equipment. And they got very confused. Um, so that can be fun to go to the craft store and buy fabric for these projects and then confuse the people who are cutting the fabric for you. But anyway, um, so this, this fuzzy tail is, aside from being fun because it's rainbow colors, it provides drag just like that drogue tail um, and it keeps kind of like you think of it like weight on the end of this this kite um, at this tail point that um, helps it to not move so much in the sky and keeps it pointed the right direction. Um, this kite is not good in gusty conditions. So if you have uh, gusty means the wind starts and stops a lot like, you know, the wind blows hard and then it will like die back and then it blows hard again and then dies back. This kite tends to flip over in the sky and will actually dive bomb and then like crash in those conditions. So if you don't have stable wind conditions, you don't wanna fly this kind of kite. Um, it is just not good for that. So, and in general, gusty conditions are not something you want to fly kites in anyway, but this one seems to be particularly sensitive to that. Um, and so <laughs> you don't wanna do that. Um, the other kite that I have um, is uh, a kite called, a, this one's the nine foot levitation delta from Into the Wind. Um, Into the Wind is a really nice um, kite store that's in Colorado. Um, and they have really good customer service, by the way. Um, not, <laughs> they don't pay me to say this. I just, it's a really good source for kites. Um, and I get really happy when they send me the catalog because it's fun to look at all the different things that they have. Um, but there's other places you can get these as well. But this is a house-made kite from that company. And um, 
the nine foot part of the title refers to how much lifting surface it has. Um, so I know it's kind of hard to tell in the um, in the picture itself, but this kite is like five feet across, I think, um, on the longest part. So it's a fairly substantial kite um, in terms of size. Um, and it's also a really good kite for lifting, um, although it can't lift quite as much as the, the parafoil. But this kite does come in a larger size, so you could potentially, if you needed to lift more weight, um, you could get the bigger one. Um, this one does have spars. Um, so it has like sticks in the on the edges and one that goes across and one that goes down the middle. Um, and you might think that um, that is, oh, I just got a delivery of a kite. Um, <laughs> so, well, I'll show you later, I guess. And I'm not sure if you can actually see this since I don't have my preview on, but this is the, the package that it comes in. So it's a fairly substantial kite. Um, So we'll get to show and tell in a minute and I'll I'll turn on my phone camera and we'll um, take a look at some of the actual equipment um, just to try that and try that out and see how it goes. Um, so um, what was I saying? Oh, so this one has spars in it and you might think like, oh, if it has the spars, it might be like breakable, but these are, um, I think they're carbon fiber. Um, so they're pretty hard to break. Also, this kite is incredibly stable. It doesn't usually like, um, do the same shenanigans as the other one that I have. So it, it generally just goes in the air and stays there. Um, so it's it's a pretty pretty good kite for this kind of thing. Um, also, you can replace the spars if you need to, um, but I think that's pretty unlikely to need to happen. Um, also, it goes together very much like a modern tent does. So the, the spars go into like sleeves inside the edge of the kite and then they tuck into like little um, like nooks in the, the kite. And so it just it stays together um, with tension. Um, and it's it's really pretty simple to put together. Um, and again, like you're putting this together, like for me out on a beach, um, it's windy, there's sand blowing everywhere, and it's really not hard to put this together, even in those kinds of conditions. So um, really super good kite for this kind of work. Um, I also will say that both of these are very good flyers. So if you get this kind of kite um, and you take it out, you want to make sure it doesn't launch itself <laughs> because they want to go up in the sky and they're designed to catch the air. So they will, and they will launch themselves when you're not looking. So um, on the beach, it's really easy to just pile up a whole bunch of sand on it. Um, and then when you're ready to fly, you just shake it off and throw it in the air and it goes. Um, so just be aware of that, especially with these larger kites that they can um, can sometimes have a mind of their own and just kind of take off if the wind is is right, they'll just pick up. So um, you want to be careful with that, that they don't do their own thing. Um, so with that, I think it's a good time to talk about some some safety issues. Um, I'm going to switch over to this uh, site called Kite Llama that Alex and I were putting together um, at one point. Um, just because it has some good safety thoughts on it. Um, I think I recall I was putting this together when I was doing my job search after grad school. So it was like a project in between and then I got a job and so it kind of didn't do much more work on it. But I think um, hopefully I will get some more time to do this and, and put some more things on here. Um, but the safety section I think is a pretty good start. So um, one of the things that I want to bring up is that um, kites are something we often think about as being like a kid's toy, and it's totally safe because it's a toy. Um, but there are some things we want to think about, especially when we're flying kites that are this large. Um, one of the things that we want to think about is FAA regulations. We are flying things in the air, so just like a drone, we are under FAA rules um, and you should find out what the specific current rules are because these are slightly older but i don't think they've changed but you want to be sure so um, in general um, the faa requires that things that are tethered such as kites and balloons need to be flown under 400 feet um, so one way to ensure that is to not okay so we're back on recording <laughs> Anyone watching this video is going to be like, that was weird. Um, okay, let me try sharing my screen again. I'm not sure what happened. Um, 
All right, so there's my screen. Weird. Okay, well, I see my Zoom things have moved around, so I guess maybe something got confused. Anyway, back to the talk. Um, so the FAA requires that anything that's tethered, such as kites or balloons, have to be flown under 400 feet. Um, how you ensure that you do that is just don't let out more than 400 feet. And then if, if you don't let out that much line, you know you're under 400, under, four, under 400 feet. <laughs> so um, that's something to keep in mind. No one's going out there with like a measuring stick or anything, but um, you want to follow the rules because that helps ensure safety. And it is the kind of ceiling where um, aircraft is, is concerned about. So that just keeps things, um, keeps you from having conflict with aircraft. Um, Let's see. Um, the other thing is that you cannot fly anything, drone, kite, balloon, within five miles of an airport without filing a notice to airmen, which is a piece of paper or like a, it's probably not paper anymore. Anyway, it's um, a form that tells the nearby airports that you're planning on flying, and then it notifies um, people who are flying aircraft to be aware of um, what you're doing in the area. Um, but all of that being said, you should always be aware of aircraft that are in your airspace. And if you think that there is something like a, a lot of times, like I work on the beach, so um, it's pretty common to see things like helicopters or um, small aircraft flying around, um, especially like in scenic places. It's not uncommon to see a small aircraft. Um, and so if Ever I hear anything that sounds like an aircraft or I see something that looks like an aircraft that I think might be coming in the direction of where my kite is, the team immediately takes the kite down. Like, don't worry about the photos. <laughs> Take the kite down because you don't want to be in conflict with an aircraft. So this is something you need to keep in mind that um, the aircraft has the right of way. You are taking the kite down if you think there might be a conflict or um, even could be one. So you want to be very aware of what's in your area and make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, this probably goes without saying, but weather is a huge issue that you need to be aware of. Um, you should never fly a kite in a thunderstorm. I think that is something we learn as kids, but um, you don't want to have your kite up in the air if you think there's any kind of electricity going on above you. Um, you also need to make sure that you're not flying your kite in wind that is stronger than your kite is rated for. Um, if you fly the kite in wind that is stronger than your kite is rated for, it is likely to tear. And then your payload, i.e. your cameras, will fall down onto the ground. <laughs> and that's not what you want. So you want to make sure that your kite is rated for the conditions that you're trying to fly in. Um, and as I mentioned before, gusty conditions are dangerous for kites. So you don't want to fly if it's gusty, if the wind is stopping and starting. Uh, do it another day because at best it's going to be a frustrating day. At worst, you're going to lose equipment or someone's going to get hurt. Um, so Matt is asking in the chat what wind speeds kites are generally rated for. Um, and Matt, that entirely depends on the kite itself. Um, so especially if you're buying from a company like Into the Wind, which I'm just mentioning because it's what I have experience with, they will tell you what the rating is on that kite. Um, and generally, the bigger the kite, the higher the wind speeds that it can handle, but um, it also depends on the design of the kite as well. Um, and also I have learned that it also depends on your clips. <laughs> so um, your clips need to be rated for the same uh, wind speed and the same weight as your kite is. Otherwise that's your weak point. And then your kite ends up flying off into space. Um, so hopefully like, that helps answer the question, Matt. Like 20 miles an hour or something like that? Or is it um, the whole spectrum? Yeah, so Alex mentions Ooh. like three to 40 miles an hour. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, sounds good, thanks. Yeah, so Naomi's asking how far, how high is uh, 400 feet? Uh, that seems really high. Uh, yeah, so that normally like my kites, I think we're flying at about like 100 feet. Um, that is always the question. Um, this was a big question for my dissertation too, was figuring out how high the balloon was that I flew for my dissertation research. Um, yeah, so <laughs> Alex is saying a 33-story building. You're probably not going to fly a kite at 400 feet. That's a lot of line to deal with. Um, 
so that's um, something to keep in mind. Um, also, if you if you are needing to take air photos at that height, you probably want to start thinking about drones or um, uh, like plane mounted systems. You know, we're we're starting to get to the point where um, kites are probably not not your best bet when you need to fly that high. So other things to keep in mind in terms of safety is that you are working with a line under tension. So this is this one surprised me too when I was starting out with kite aerial photography. I found a site um, that was talking about how um, this is a line under tension and the, um, the line that you're using on your kite, you have to remember that you're getting a line that is rated for heavy weights, like between 50 to 300 pound braking strength that is a pretty strong piece of cord like we're talking more in the realm of rope <laughs> in terms of the amount of weight that this can handle um so you would want to consider um this is going to be pretty morbid but if that line were to get wrapped around your finger or your arm or god forbid your neck and that kite took off um with a strong wind you could do some serious damage to your body because that line is not going to break but your body will. <laughs> so you really want to be careful and you want to think about um, where that line is when it's flying, but also where it is when it's not flying. So we have a rule when people fly with me, um, there is a rule that if the line is on the ground and you need to cross it, you must step on it. Um, and the reason for that is that if for some reason the kite were to launch itself um, and you were in the process of stepping over it, that line would catch you under your body and that would be unpleasant um, and potentially damaging. So you don't want to do that. Always step on the line. Um, and then also when you're flying the kites, um, the people who are on the flight team, whoever has the reel and is, is doing the actual controlling of the kite itself, um, everyone else who is on the crew is standing behind the person with the reel. So if I have the reel and you're helping, you're standing behind me unless you're helping take the kite down or launch it. And you always want to keep an eye on where that line is when it's flying because, um, Again, the kite can move around in the sky and can change directions depending on the wind. So you always want to make sure you're staying away from the line and you want to make sure that that line is never going to cross your body because that is when things get dangerous. Um, so remember, line under tension is not, not a child's toy. This is something that is actually potentially dangerous. Um, if you're cautious, though, it's probably fine. Um, you're probably not going to have any issues, but you want to be careful about these things. Um, also, you never fly this kind of kite by yourself. This is not a go out, um, you know, and have a fun time with a kite that can lift several pounds because it can get some serious pull on it and um, it can potentially, I've read some horror stories about people like getting their shoulders dislocated. Um, and so <laughs> that's not going to happen though to you if you are careful. Um, but you do need a couple people, if nothing else, to take the kite down. Um, check out my YouTube channel. There's actually a video of how to take down one of these big kites. Um, and it requires one person to hold on to the reel and at least one other person to walk down hand over hand uh, down the line to pull the kite down. You cannot reel them in like a fish. Um, they have too much tension on the line. It won't come down that way. So you actually need a team of people to bring the kite down. So do not fly by yourself. Um, it's not a, not definitely not a thing to do um, by yourself. Um, also, don't fly near power lines. That probably goes without saying. You learned this as a kid. Um, don't fly over people um, because things can happen. So those are the general, I think, good safety tips to follow. Um, but you know, use your common sense. If there was something I didn't mention here, um, you know, and you realize that you need to pay attention to that thing, um, pay attention to it. Um, just be careful. Um, so that's your safety talk. Um, I think the big take home here is lines under tension are, are the real deal. Um, so next I want to talk about um, cameras. Unless, do we have any other questions about um, the kites themselves or the safety issues around flying kites? I mentioned this in chat, but you might want to talk about that we just don't fly in high winds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. Um, so it's really important to look at the forecast for where you're going and finding out what the, 
the forecast is going to be and and knowing what the rating is on your kite um, because these are um, like I can show you in this picture. Let me zoom in a bit. Um, so this is me holding this is one of our like earlier reels that um, was not super ideal, but you can kind of see how much I'm bracing my body into this this line. Um, the higher the wind, the more that kite is going to pull. And so um, you want to not, um, you don't want to fly in high winds because it could break your kite, but also they become a lot more hard to handle um, and you require a lot more um, upper body strength than just um, strength in general to hold these. Like this is, this is a pretty uh, physical process to control these things because of the weight they're pulling. So yeah, definitely um, 25 miles an hour is, is probably the limit. Um, and you would want to, you'd want to do some test runs at various wind speeds to see how you, you were, your particular body and your setup with your kite works too, and um, kind of figure out what that, what that limit is, but definitely the kite will be rated for certain, certain wind speeds. So you want to pay attention to that as well. Other questions about the kites? We can always talk more too um, as questions come up. All right. So um, cameras are the next thing. So the point of this whole system, right, is to put some kind of remote sensing device on the on the, the kite line itself. Um, so things you want to think about, um, the lighter the weight for the payload, the better. So um, a, a lighter camera is going to be easier to lift. It's going to also, um, the kite itself is going to fly better with less weight on the line. The more weight you put on the line, the more erratic the kite gets sometimes um, because it has this weight on the middle of the line that's moving around, but it's also weighing it down. So um, the phys physics get a little weird. <laughs> so lighter weight camera is better. Um, you also want some kind of system to trigger it because the camera is not going to trigger itself. Um, it needs to know when to take the picture. So in the past, we've used um, programs that go on the SD card for the cameras, um, something called uh, CHDK or SDM. There may be other things um, that are available now. I'm not sure. I, these slides are a little bit on the old side. Um, but I do know that one of those programs is on the cameras sitting right here that have been on kites. Um, I would also mention as you're getting started, um, you probably want to think about um, a camera that is going to be less expensive just to, um, you know, because it might crash, <laughs> you might lose it. Um, so either that or practice flying your kite with a, a payload, some, some kind of weight that is about the same as, as the camera you want to fly um, and get used to that before you strap something expensive onto the line, just in case, um, because things can happen. Um, uh, the other thing that I've done too is flying over grassy fields, like in the city of Davis, there's all kinds of parks and um, school fields you can use when school's not in session. So um, that can also help because if something falls out of the sky, it's landing on grass, it's a little bit more cushy than, you know, something harder like rocks. <laughs> fly at the beach there's there can be rocks um you can also modify these cameras to collect um like i have consumer grade cameras that i fly on these you could probably also get drone cameras um, that you could attach as well um, but the consumer grade cameras are nice because um, we put stickers on them so that you can tell if they're infrared or um, regular if it's got a pink sticker um, the inside of the camera the filter has been removed um, the filter that's inside blocks infrared light so if you take that off the camera can then record infrared um, and then we put a lens on the front of it that blocks um, visible light so that all it can record is infrared so we get the ability to do um, rgb and infrared um, so i get a four band um, image out of that particular system um, so that's nice it's good for vegetation um, if you wanted other spectra you could either get cameras that are tuned to that particular um, spectra spectrum that you're interested or set of spectra um, or you could get um, potentially like the the kinds of sensors you put on drones you could also fly on a kite um, so so that's an option um, these are previous cameras i've used they are 
digital SLRs. These are heavy. Um, and I think that um, in terms of the amount of data you can take now with smaller cameras, these are not as necessary. Um, you can get pretty good quality images with the regular consumer grade cameras or something that's designed for remote sensing. Um, this is a quick little diagram of the housing that I have for my cameras. So um, because I work on beach systems where there's a lot of sand on the beach and when the um, when the kite is coming down, um, sometimes the camera itself will get in the sand. And so to prevent uh, having the camera lens get rubbed into the sand, um, I have a housing around the whole setup that kind of allows the camera itself to not get into the dirt as much. Um, you don't necessarily need this kind of thing um, unless you're concerned about stuff like sand. Um, and I think we've flown without it. And it, it really depends on the day whether you want it or not. If it's a pretty um, like good wind day, um, everything's much more controlled. You don't really have to worry about this because someone can just pick up the camera before it hits the ground. Um, and then hang on to it as they bring down the rest of the, the kite line. Um, but the idea is that you have, um, basically, these are things you can make at the hardware store or you can buy them. Um, I'll give you a link to a place I found yesterday that sells equipment for this kind of thing. But this is just an aluminum rod that is bent at an, like a 90 degree angle. Um, it's attached to the peak of that system that I mentioned before. And then there is a screw that goes through the bar at the end that attaches to the camera. Um, what you may not realize um, is that, I'll share my other screen in a minute. The bottom of consumer grade cameras actually have a screw hole in the bottom that you can use to attach um, things like tripods, but it's also a really convenient way to attach the um, camera mount to your kite um, works just the same. I will, will say it's really nice if you can, since I'm in Davis, we have an awful lot of bike tubes left over. So we just cut up pieces of bike tubes uh, to use uh, a nice little rubber pad between the camera and uh, the mounting bar so that um, it can attach nice and tight and it doesn't wiggle around. And again, in my world, sand is a problem. So it kind of keeps the sand from getting inside things. Um, but if you're not working in on a beach, sand isn't as big an issue. Um, so before I show you some more equipment stuff, um, this is kind of what the photos look like that come out of the system that I have. So um, we've got um, the color photo here on this side and then the infrared photo that came out of the matching infrared camera. Um, these are mounted side by side. So if you're really, uh, if you've got a really good eye, you can tell these aren't 100% the exact same image because they're from cameras that are sitting next to each other, but they cover pretty much the same area. Um, so this is a dune, a uh, set of dunes on a beach in Santa Barbara. Um, you can see the plants. I, always, I like this one because it kind of looks like a little face. It's got two eyes and a nose, um, but it's also really easy to pick out in the photo set um, because of the structure that you're looking at. But so the color one looks just like you would expect the color photo. The infrared one looks pink. And the reason for that is because when you take out the um, the infrared filter from the inside of the camera, and then you put the color filter on the front that blocks out all visible light and only lets infrared through, um, it only records well, it records mostly on the red channel of the camera. So um, when you just pull the image off the camera, they all look pink. Um, but ideally, you're going to separate out just the red channel out of this image and put it together with the, um, the RGB channels from the other one. So um, this is a different set of photos, but you get the idea. So out of the the regular camera, you pull out the R, the red, the green, and the blue channels. And then from the infrared camera, you pull out just the, the red band to get the infrared reflectance. And then you can smash them all together and then you get a four band image. Um, I say this like it didn't take a lot of figuring out how to do all this stuff. It does take time to figure out how to put all this stuff together, um, but it is totally doable. And now um, I'll show you in a minute um, how to use open drone map to put, um, to actually mosaic all of these together. Um, but some kite accessories that you might want to have available is, um, so the camera housing is one thing to think about. If you need it, um, 
you want to think about that ahead of time, um, depending on your system you're working in. And by system, I mean the environment. <laughs> um, a shutter timer is necessary. So the, the programming type situation is better than something that is a physical thing, like something that pushes the button. Um, just because of weight. So the more things that go on to the kite, the more weight it has, and then the harder it is to fly. So um, something digital is better than something physical, the, like a, a servo that has to push a button. Um, it's not as good. Um, so you also want a peak of it. I can show you what that looks like in a second. Um, a reel is a really good idea. This particular reel in the picture uh, it's not great. <laughs> we'll show you what we currently use. Um, I actually use a deep sea fishing reel for, for this now and it's much better. Um, you need gloves. Like this is not negotiable. You have to have gloves and they have to be leather or something that's really tough because this is again a line under tension and abrasions are way more likely than decapitation and you will not like the abrasions for sure on your hands. Um, and I've worn through pairs of gloves um, where the line runs inside your palm and um, it will tear apart the gloves and you would really rather have the glove tear apart than your hand. So you do need leather gloves. Um, for people like me who have smaller hands, um, it's now a little bit easier to find gloves that fit. Um, so go to the garden center and look for leather gardening gloves and chances are now you'll find things in your size. But if you don't, ask for them or look for them online. But it really has to be something like leather that is going to protect your hands. like cloth gloves are not going to do anything for you. Um, and then the other thing for, like I mentioned before, is the kite tail. Um, all right, so that was sort of a whirlwind of accessories, and I can show you some of those in a second. It looks like Derek has a comment um, that it's cool how you hack the, the cameras. <laughs> yeah, it, um, you can actually buy them too if you don't want to do the actual physical hacking of them yourself. Um, there's a company called Max Max that will take them apart for you and sell you uh, modified cameras. So if you want to just buy them, which I have done, especially the SLRs, I was not going to do myself. The, the S100s are a lot cheaper. So, you know, it's not such a big deal if you screw it up, but, um, you know, five to $700 camera, you don't really want to do yourself. Um, okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to stop the share here and I'm going to see if it will let me share my start my video. I have to enable sharing for myself. Hold on. Oh, stop it. Sorry, Zoom is again being um, is being annoying. Okay, it says everybody can share. Oh, okay. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is um, right now you can see um, you can see the, <laughs> the participant that's called Michelle Tobias's phone um, is. Um, showing my keyboard at the moment. Um, I'm going to recommend on Zoom, you change your view. Um, and I don't know if it'll let you spotlight. Oh, maybe I can spotlight my phone. Um, so hopefully what just happened is you're seeing um, your screen is spotlighting um, my phone right now, and it's just showing you my keyboard. Looks good. But, okay. Um, so really quick. Um, these are the cameras that I'm currently using to fly. I mentioned that the bottom of the camera has a um, place in it to attach a tripod. And right now I've got camera mounting screws in these guys. Um, so there's, it's, this one is gummed up with sand. Um, it will take some torque to get that out. <laughs> I was going to pull it out, but it's not going to be easy. Um, so there's just a, a little port in the bottom of this that you can screw in a screw and then the um, mounting bracket can go between there and then um, it can go onto the camera housing. So I'm gonna get some things out of the way. So, um, 
what you're looking at here um, is the reel that I currently use. Um, yeah, that's okay to look at. Um, sorry if I'm giving anyone motion sickness. Um, so this is a deep sea fishing reel <laughs> um, and it's loaded with I think 50 pound breaking strength Dacron line. Um, so this is pretty substantial line that's on here. Um, and if for those of you who are um, interested in like deep sea fishing, some of this will look familiar, but like this is a pretty substantial line. Like this is not your typical like kite string um, that you might think of when you're thinking of like kids kites. Um, and this is a pretty big reel. Um, the nice thing is like um, this part um, on the end braces on your hip and then this part you hold on to. Um, and then the strap goes over your shoulder, but you never would attach the kite line to your body um, itself. You can slide this off your shoulder pretty easy and drop it if you needed to. Um, so this thing itself is pretty heavy and then you've got the kite yanking on it. Um, so this is a pretty physical process to fly a kite um, of this size um, and lifting this much weight. Um, other goodies I've got in here. This is um, the camera housing um, that can go onto that um, trash can rig I talked about. So um, this cross piece is where these cameras get mounted. So they kind of go like that and point down. So you can see this one has a place for two different cameras or you can attach them on to any of the holes on the L bracket there. The top of this thing is um, the thing called a peak of that I was talking about. And this one is chained up so that it doesn't get um, it doesn't get tangled, but I can give you a link to look at a commercial one of these. But essentially this is just made with um, aluminum and eye bolts that go through it. And then the line can slide around. I can't can't actually demonstrate this guy. Um, while I'm holding my phone because <laughs> it needs two hands. But essentially um, what this does is it keeps, um, it keeps your camera level and pointed down no matter what the angle of the kite line is because ideally as this angle shifts, um, the line slides around in these eye bolts and keeps everything level. Um, it's also uh, a safe way with the, with the carabiners, you actually wrap the line around the carabiner so you never have a knot. So you don't end up putting um, any tension on the line itself so you don't have a breaking point. Um, so that's important because you don't want the kite line to break. I've had a kite clip break um, and the kite flies away and it's the saddest thing. Um, it's terrifying. And then my kite actually ended up landing in the North Davis pond um, and we had to go get it. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know if there's anything else in the list of things you wanted to see. Um, here's examples of like gloves. Um, you can kind of see on these gloves, like the rub marks. This is from the line itself. Um, and these gloves are pretty new looking, um, but I have gloves that we've worn completely through from the line sliding. Um, there's other things in here, like um, safety equipment for visibility that can be helpful. Um, There's one of the kites. I don't know. If someone wants to ask questions while I dig through the bucket, um, go ahead. I don't know if there's anything else you want to see in here. You want to just show the kite bag that you've got there? Yeah, so I could do that. I'll put them on the floor. Sorry, you get to see my striped socks probably. Um, so this is the kite itself, the kite bag uh, for the nine foot levitation delta. So this is pretty big. Um, it's like hip height on me. Um, so that's the length of the longest, um, the longest side of the kite because the, the length of this is because of the spars. So it's a pretty, pretty big kite. <laughs> um, hey, Michelle, this is Naomi. Yeah. How much, um, <clears throat> how, how much, how many feet of line are on that um, gigantic, deep sea fishing reel oh, that that looks really cool that looks like 
I, the weaver in me thinks, ooh, that would be the best <laughs> shuttle ever. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> or, I could. Or warp board or something. But yeah, that's really cool looking. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I've forgotten. I'd have to go back to my order from Into the Wind and find out what we ordered. Um, I'm guessing it's 100 feet. It's probably more than that. Maybe. Maybe it's 300. Yeah, it might be 300. Yeah, I'm not sure. These are the I mean, things you forget if you don't write them down. <laughs> the trick is, is that your kite's never going to fly directly above your head because kites don't work that way. So a 400 foot line is never going to go straight up. So you're always going to be under 400, even if you have a 400 foot line. Here we go. Um, yeah, so I... that. I'm not entirely sure how much it is, but I can look it up. Um, but yeah, line capacity, like the, the capacity of the reel is also important because like um, you want to have space on it. I also say one of the things you want to be careful of too is um, like with this reel, you can actually like, you can reel it in and you do actually use that part of it when the kite is flying and you need to like um, sometimes the wind will slow down and the kite kind of comes down in elevation and then you get slack on the line. So then you can um, take up the slack um, on the line with the reel. But if you reel it up under tension, what happens is that line, um, it has some stretch to it, even though you don't really notice it. Um, and I was reading a website where they said if you leave the line on the reel um, that was reeled in under tension, um, eventually the line will contract and it will collapse the reel. Um, that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. So what happens is after we fly, um, within like a few hours, I'll actually take all the line off the reel and reel it back on under no tension so that it doesn't cause any problems for the line itself. Um, you wouldn't want to leave it under tension anyway because you need that stretch um, when it's flying for safety. So. Um, so yeah, so just be careful with these things. They are serious business. <laughs> okay, so um, if there are any other questions, let's hold those till the end, because I want to show you open drone map um, for the photo processing part of things. Um, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so... Um, Oh, I'll put this in the, the chat too. Um, this was the website where um, they have, um, basically they sell equipment for um, kite aerial photography, kite aerial photography. So you can get an idea of like, like here's an example of a peak of it on this thing that's scrolling around. Um, so you can get an idea of what's out there and the kinds of things you might need. Um, I'm not finding the peak of vets, but you can search for it. Um, they have them commercially there. And there's other places that sell them. Um, so, um, but also feel free to just ask me questions, like come to Data Lab office hours and ask, or um, you can send me emails and stuff like that. I'm happy to answer questions about equipment as you, if you're putting one of these together and you have questions um, or you want to get started, uh, I'm happy to help with that. Okay, so shifting over, once you get um, once you get your photos, you've flown your kite or whatever it is you're flying, um, and you have your photos, and now you're like, now what do I do with them? Um, because individual photos are not that useful. Um, generally, what you want to do with them is take all these individual photos, just like you would from a drone, and make them into a scene. Um, so one big image that covers a bigger area and also you might want to do um, a process to create a 3D model of the, the terrain that you've taken photos of. So how do you do that? There are multiple ways to do this. Um, the tool that I am most familiar with and I think works really nicely is um, a, it's turned into an ecosystem at this point, like it says here, um, is Open Drone Map. There is a bunch of different tools that kind of fall into this family of tools and um generally they're pretty useful i 
actually found out um, at the last Phosphor-G event that I, I guess was the first user of this software that wasn't involved in the development of it. Um, someone I met at Phosphor-G um, was doing this and I needed to stitch photos. And so um, this is how open source works. You've got a use case and you've got people writing software. You find each other in various ways. In this case, it was at a conference and was like, hey, let's stitch these photos. So. Um, the photo set I'm going to show you today is actually um, the first photo set that I had um, that needed to be stitched and it's um, still in the example uh, data. So you can make your own one of these if you want, or you can get some other data as well. Um, so open drone map is, uh, again, it's for stitching photos, it's for processing photos that um, it's both for aerial photos, but you can also use it for making 3D models of things that you didn't take with drones and kites and stuff like that. But we're going to focus on the drone and kite part of this. Um, I will show you their data set collection. There is some um, fun data sets of things like a, a bunch of bananas that you can build a 3D model of, but I'm going to show you dune systems today. <laughs> um, so I'm on the open drone map website, which I can pop in the chat for you. Um, but it's just opendronemap.org. Um, there's a bunch of different tools that they describe on their site. I'm just scrolling down here. Um, if you are going to process images, chances are you either want um, ODM, so open drone map. Uh, this is the command line tool. So you can just tell it, this is the you know, place where my photos are, stitch things for me. Um, or you can use web ODM, which is the, tool that is a graphical user interface. Um, so I'm going to recommend those are probably the you're going to want one of those two things um, if you're doing this. And um, I'm actually using web ODM. So I'll show you how to set that up um, in general. We're not going to do all of the steps together, but just so you kind of get an idea of, of what it takes um, to get that running. Um, there are a bunch of other tools here that um, if you're interested, you should check out. Um, one of the ones I am going to point out is uh, field image R, which is a package for R <laughs> um, that I didn't realize was related to open drone map because I think when I was using it, I don't think it had been sort of absorbed into the ecosystem yet, but it's a really cool package if you are working with um, images that are coming out of agricultural fields. Um, because if you've worked with ag field data, you know it's kind of quirky sometimes because you have a lot of linear things going on. And um, this is a tool that's specifically designed to help you process those images in R. So once you stitch things together, um, you can use field image R to, to do some of the processing. So I just wanted to point that out. We're not gonna look at it today, but I saw it on the list. And I was like, oh, that's so cool, they're connected. Um, so again, I'm gonna show you a how I use web ODM, but for those of you who are more um, excited about command line stuff or want to bring that into a larger workflow, um, you might want to take a look at the regular version. So I'm just going to go to their project site. Um, and they've got things here. They've got demos, screenshots, a little video, things you can do with it. So check that out. But I'll show you a live version of this. So if I want to download it, um, there's two different flavors of this. You can either install it manually for free, and there's good documentation for how to do this. Or if you don't want to mess with all of that, um, there is an installer that you can purchase. And um, the cost of that goes to support the project itself. Um, but I will say installing it with um, like yourself uh, from their instructions is really not too difficult. Um, the biggest challenge is actually if you're not familiar with the tools that you need to to get started with it. Um, that's where the, the trouble spots are. So um, you need to download everything that's on the GitHub repository. So you need some form of Git. Um, you need Docker and Docker Compose. So um, those are things you can install. Um, you also need Python and pip, um, which is, I think, part of I think that's now included in the install things that come in the repository. You used to have to install things separately, but um, once you have all of these things installed, <laughs> all you need to do is clone the repository. So essentially you're downloading everything on this particular website that's related to the project and you're basically running this command in bash uh, and it will install itself. Um, 
so this is as someone who did this on windows um it's slightly different for i think for doing it on linux but generally really similar um so again the hardest part is these things to get the download working but once you get that set up um it's essentially running like let's call it three lines of command line in bash to get this going so i'm not going to walk through how to do that today but if you have questions um and you're, you're a uc davis person come to drop in hours and i'll see if i can help um sort some of the stuff out um, for other folks there's a really good community around this particular tool so if you're on twitter or on mastodon or other social media places chances are you can find somebody to um to help you answer questions about installing this. So um, I definitely recommend trying it and don't hesitate to ask the community questions because people are really friendly in this group. Um, so now that you've had the talk about how you just need to get over a couple hurdles and then you can install it yourself, let me show you how this thing actually works. So I have this running in Docker. Um, this is what the Docker thing for Windows looks like. And I've just, um, I have web ODM set up and I tell it to run and then it runs and it pretends that it's in a Linux box and it runs in my web browser for me, which I find to be completely helpful. Um, as a geo person, I'm very visual, so I really like graphical tools, even though I can program in multiple languages, I really appreciate being able to see things. So earlier, um, a couple days ago, I actually ran um, a a process for you. You can see it took about 15 minutes, so it's good that I did it ahead of time because otherwise we'd be just sitting here waiting for it to finish. Um, but if I, oh, it's gonna do one task. Um, oh, add project. That's what I want to do. Um, so I'm just gonna call it test two. I'm not actually gonna run stuff, but I'm gonna create a project. Um, and all I have to do is find my ground control points navigate to where they are in this case my images are in this folder so i just select all of them and then i'm also going to get my ground control point list oops anyway this worked before open and then i'm going to add my ground control points So these are all, all of this stuff came from the, um, the data, um, the example data repository. So I've got my images, I've got my ground control point list, um, because these images weren't, um, weren't geotagged. Um, I need the ground control point list that we made from the images. Um, if it's a something like a drone situation or um, a camera that is GPS enabled, that stuff's already embedded and you don't need the ground control point list. So basically all I have to do is tell it, let's review this. After I click review, it's gonna say, um, start processing, click okay, and it runs. Um, so I, we're not gonna run this though, cause it's gonna take another 15 minutes, but I can show you what this looks like when it's done. And of course, my zoom control things are on top of what I'm trying to look at. You don't see it, but I do. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's finished. And what we can do is just to start, let's view the map. Um, so it's going to look at my air photos and it put them together into the scene, which kind of looks like a kind of a long jelly bean kind of shape here. Um, you'll notice this is because this is a dune system and things on beaches are pretty ephemeral, you'll notice that these dunes don't actually match up with the photo behind it. And that is to be expected just because these were taken in different years, different times of um, different times of the year. Um, possibly, I don't know, I see my water lines line up, so they might be about the same time of year, but I'm not 100% sure. So anyway, the fact that the this photo doesn't quite line up um, with the other dunes is completely reasonable given the system. If you were working on something that involved like streets and man-made objects that are pretty permanent um, and they don't line up, then I'd worry. But because it's dunes, I'm not, not super concerned. But so I can zoom in. I'm just using my scroll to zoom in on, on the picture. And you can kind of see um, like here's a, a nice dune. Um, and it has um, some vegetation on the top, really dense, but then it has some plants kind of less dense around it. Um, I'll tell you, these are runners from these clumps of plants here. 
Um, and then there's other plants down here that are making little dunes. And you can kind of get a sense for the topography of it just looking at the photos. Um, also, the, um, the sun angle on these is kind of low, so you kind of get some shadows, which helps you kind of see the dunes and things like that. But this is pretty nice, actually, for just taking photos with a camera over a dune system with a balloon, in this case, not kites, but really similar system. Um, these black and white things that you see in the photo are actually the, the ground control part, point targets that we put out and then we GPS these and that gives us the locations for the images. So that's where the ground control point list comes from is these targets that are out in the field. Um, so this is super cool. Um, this still makes me happy even though this set of photos was taken many, many years ago. Um, still seeing it come together and work in this project is super cool. Um, plus, you know, you've got like 100 photos that are individual little things that you can't see much in, and then you put them all together and all of a sudden you can start assessing, you know, the relationship between the plants and the dunes and the topography. So that's fun. Um, I'm going to go back to the dashboard here really quick. Back to my task. And um, the next thing I want to look at is the 3D model because this is another thing that makes me just happy is that you can make 3D models from a set of photographs taken from a consumer grade camera. Why not? Um, so <laughs> this is what it looks like when it loads. It's got some um, discontinuities here, but I'm not too worried about that. Um, if I was going to do this again, I would just make sure that I had better coverage. Um, so as I <clears throat> grab the image with my mouse, click and drag, I can reposition this 3D model, spin it around in space, I can zoom in on it with the scroll wheel, and we can start to see the topography that it's built. Um, there's a fair amount of exaggeration in this um, result, but that's okay because um, we want to be able to see the dunes, which are generally pretty subtle otherwise. Um, so I will say like the this dune here when you're standing next to it is probably maybe chest height. These are not enormous. Um, and these little guys down here are like maybe, maybe ankle height. <laughs> so they're, they're pretty short. Um, but you can kind of get a sense that um, it was pretty successful in building a, a topographic model from the photos. Um, and so again, all, all the inputs that are going into this are consumer grade photographs taken from a balloon system, which is very similar to the kite system I showed you. Um, and then ground control points for locations. And it's kind of figuring out the elevations on its own, which is why there's some exaggeration. But this is pretty cool. <laughs> you can do this with um, with other systems too. It's Dunes are nice, especially for um, the photo stitching, because they tend to be fairly smooth. So that works pretty well for the algorithms that are building the 3D models. Um, I will say that sometimes um, man-made objects that have hard edges like buildings come out a little funky in this. Um, and there's some corrections that you can do um, and some parameters you can change to help with that. But um, natural systems work really nicely for this kind of thing just because of the, the smooth nature of the system that you're working on and the, the structure that you're modeling tends to be more smooth than like a building or a car or something like that. Um, Another way to get around some of that, if you really were interested in, in um, building a model of something that was like a building, um, is to take photos around the thing more. So one of the reasons why there's gaps in this model is because there wasn't um, photos that overlapped here um, very well, um, is my guess. And so it didn't actually get photos of the sides of things. Um, if the camera moved too quick, it would have skipped over that. Um, so you just want to make sure that you get good overlap in your photos. You actually want like 30 to 50% overlap um, between your photos in order to get really good matches and to build a 3D model well. Um, but this was this was the first attempt at doing this, so <laughs> pretty pleased how it turned out. Um, and then it still works, you know, many, many years later. Um, so question in the chat. Um, it's interesting that the ortho mosaic is continuous, but the 3D model has gaps. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with that, um, why there's gaps in the 3D model, but not in um, not in the ortho mosaic. And it might just have to do with not like, you can stitch the photos visually, I think, um, but the 3D model, I think probably needed more overlap to actually create the model. Cause I think there's more data that needs to go into that um, is my guess. 
Um, also, I know there wasn't great coverage on the back dune system here just by the nature of where we were taking the photos. Um, it's a lot harder to walk. Um, if you've ever been to Coal Oil Point on the Santa, UC Santa Barbara campus, um, these dunes back here get thicker um, and it's a lot more hilly, so it was harder to walk there. And also I was, I was mostly interested in this like first line of vegetation, so that's why there's better coverage there. Um, so flight planning is still a thing with kites. You have to figure out where you can actually walk when you're flying the kite, because if you want the kite to move, it's not like a drone where you tell the drone, move here, move there, move here. Um, you actually have to walk with the kite and kind of drag it through the sky to get it where you want to go. So um, you have to be able to walk in places to get to position the kite over what you want to, to have it take pictures of. Um, and not actually the kite, it's actually the camera housing needs to be over the thing you want to take pictures of. So you kind of have to guess. Um, it's a little, it's less precise than like drone flight planning just by nature of the, the tool itself. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the general process. I know this, like showing you the web ODM tool makes it all look super easy. Um, there is a little finessing to this. Um, I'll stop sharing, so I'll stop just waving my hands and pointing at things on the screen. Um, there is a little bit of finessing to it, like picking the photos, like you might find some photos are not as um, useful. And so there might be some iteration to the process, but the photos that are on the open drone map, um, uh, data uh, repository are really nice examples where the kind of weeding has been done for you so you know they'll work if you want to try it you can go grab data from there um, and I can pop that link in the um, I think I have it there it is um, so I can put the link for the data site in the the chat um, if I mean you can find it on the repository too, but just in case anyone wants to go grab data. I was really tempted to try the banana data set just because it sounded like it was super fun. <laughs> uh, but they have a lot of other um, sites that are um, like you can think more traditional drone kind of imagery to play with um, that works really well. And the data set I just showed you is the one that's called COPR um, for Coal Oil Point Reserve. Um, so I don't know, are there any questions? Um, that you have or you want to see other equipment um, that I've got. Um, again, today was pretty put together pretty quickly. So um, you have thoughts or questions you want to share. Um, you can either put them in the chat or you can unmute and ask them live. Um, either way is totally fine with me. Michelle, this is Naomi. You yeah. had a question in the chat from Doug um, asking if you could talk about balloons, the difference mm -hmm. in similarities to kites. I, I stepped out for a moment. I might have missed yeah. it, but if you can. Yeah, thanks. I did not see that one. Um, yeah, so balloons, um, balloons can be really similar in a lot of ways in the fact that like so the FAA regulations are really similar because it's tethered um so a balloon system instead of having a kite you would replace it with a balloon of some sort um like I said I have a it's called a miniature hot air balloon um that's maybe 10 or 15 feet high when it's inflated um that system I don't recommend in California just because so much of our ecosystem is meant to burn. So having an open flame in California is kind of, and in natural systems is a little scary. I realized once we got it out into the real world, um, it seemed less scary flying it in the arboretum over grass. Um, but so um, on that also, <laughs> Alex mentions propane is also expensive. Yes. Um, so you need, and with the kites, um, the lift that you're getting, so the the force that brings things up in the air, you're relying on wind movement. Wind is free, although sometimes it's, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of the weather. Um, when you're working with a balloon system, you have to provide the lift either in the form of hot air, like burning propane um, or some other fuel, or um, if you're flying, you can use weather balloons. Um, but you have to put something in that weather balloon to make it fly um, and the most logical choice is helium but helium is expensive and hard to find these days where um, we have a shortage of helium so actually getting access to it is really difficult and the volume of helium that you need to fly a weather balloon um, i've worked with balloon systems if um, 
for those of you who remember back when we had the protests over the um, pepper spraying incident on campus, it worked with a team to fly a helium balloon over the protests to take the air photos that you might have seen on the news. Um, that takes a lot of helium and that's expensive. <laughs> and then you also have to haul around a can of helium with you to your research site. Um, so that's somewhat impractical depending on where you're flying. Um, you know, if it's a more urban setting, then it's probably easier, um, but then you have to deal with like power lines and um, trees and stuff like that they will get in your way. So um, there's trade-offs on all of that, but the system itself, like the um, the camera system for a balloon would be really similar to what I just talked about. Um, you still, still have the same issues, like weight is still gonna be an issue for the balloon. Um, because also remember the balloon is not just lifting um, your camera housing and your cameras and all of that stuff. It's also lifting the weight of the weather balloon itself that you're using. So you have to think about, you know, how much helium do you need to not only lift the balloon, but also um, lifting the, the cameras and stuff like that. Um, also, um, there are different grades of balloons. So you can get like, you know, the disposable weather balloons that are meant for one time use, those are less stable. So if um, you're way more likely to have that pop and drop your cameras, um, you know, things can go wrong with something that's meant to be one time use. But then you can also get vinyl balloons that are meant for reuse, but those are more expensive. Um, they also are heavier. So you have to have more helium to lift them. So there's just trade offs. Um, it really depends on the ecosystem you're trying to image. Um, and what makes the most sense for you, whether it's a drone or a balloon or a kite, um, you kind of have to kind of think these things out, you know, um, it's cost, it's the environment, it's what's overhead, um, you know, obviously kites don't work in, you know, tree areas, balloons aren't going to work in tree areas either because they're the line, it's going to get tangled in branches and stuff like that if you're in a closed canopy system, so in that case you do need a drone. Um, so anyway, trade-offs. <laughs> I would recommend if you're curious about any of that, start doing your research on like what kind of um, equipment is available and you know what the input costs are for, for things that you might not have expected, um, like the helium and stuff like that, if you're thinking about a balloon. So hopefully that answered your question or at least got you some ideas of how to get started on that. <laughs> uh, Any other questions? I have a question for you. This is yeah. Naomi again. I think everybody knows my voice on this recording by now. <laughs> Michelle, would you like to tell us a little about, I mean, you just had a kite delivered. You have a new reel. What are you doing in the field these days? Can you talk a little about your research? Yeah, so these are these are things I've had for a while, but um, actually I'm going to be, um, I got invited to give a talk in um, near Santa Cruz in a couple months, so I'm going to plan on doing, as long as the weather cooperates, I'm going to plan on doing a flight out there. Um, what I'm really interested in um, is like, so my, my general research interest is understanding um, California coastal vegetation, especially things like sandy beach vegetation and dunes. And so what I would like to do is get a really good data set um, of a dune system and start doing things like the kind of things you do with remote sensing, right? Like, I'm curious about, like, can we actually identify the plant species that are there? Um, one of the, the things about um, California native vegetation in general is that it tends to be fairly silver in color. Everything tends to be gray and fuzzy because that helps it retain water and it, you know, all the good, you know, plant biology things that being um, very reflective and having, um, you know, little fuzzes on your leaves does for you. Um, but because they're all the same color, they can be really hard to tell apart in, um, in the images that I've taken um, previously. So I'm curious if we can get a really solid data set um, and either use um, like texture or color or, um, even like dune topography to identify the plants. And then also if we can do that, potentially flying multiple times a year to start really understanding how things are changing um, in terms of the topography. So I'm really interested in like the biogeomorphology of um, the dune system and, and stuff like that. And these are things that really can relate to um, coastal protection and you know sea level rise and more storm action and stuff like that. Um, but it really hasn't 
to the best of my knowledge, hasn't really been uh, hammered out very well. So, um, so that's really what I would like to do with this. Um, if folks want to fly kites um, and want to get started with that, I'm, I'm happy to help people. And you know, I wish there was a, a good place to demo this on campus, but it kind of is. Um, like actually flying is can be challenging because we can't schedule the weather so it kind of would have to be a oh good it's a, a relatively windy day let's go out to the big field in the arboretum and try this um so um so yeah hopefully that helps answer your question i i could talk forever about what i want to do with the photos <laughs> i think it's no, a lot very of interesting <laughs> and i was just curious if it was related to your work at the data lab or if you have independent research going on and it yeah. sounds like fascinating multi um not disciplinary but you yeah. know far we have had a lot of importations and really interesting so thanks for sharing that with us yeah i mean this is this is stuff that i can do kind of on the side um outside of data lab but it's pretty inexpensive to do on your own so um you know it's a good excuse to go to the beach <laughs> did we ever mention how inexpensive Oh, um, I don't know. I don't like I wouldn't know what the cost of it is currently given inflation and things like that. But it is I would venture to say like it's probably a tenth of the cost of a drone. Um, also, the weight, if you if you need to pack this somewhere like a balloon or a kite is going to be a lot less heavy than um, than a drone system like, you know, drones come in big cases and and things like that. So um, weight is also potentially a concern depending on where you're going. But again, this can't be in like a tall ecosystem. Like you're not gonna do this in a forest, so. Just to um, clarify, nine foot levitation delta is currently 129. Oh, that's not very, that hasn't gone up in price very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, and no fuel, you don't have to fuel this thing. You just need wind. Uh, so the, the inputs on this are pretty minimal and there's no charging of things except the cameras. The camera batteries need charging, but you don't need like electricity to run this. Um, the hot air balloon remarkably needed electricity because we had to have a fan to get it started. So that was not a good choice um, on a beach. Um, so yeah, um, I think the biggest expense with the kites, honestly, is probably the cameras. And then if you're going to, you know, buy the equipment like the the peak of it and like the camera um, housing stuff that might be a little on the pricey side but um you can a lot of this can be done diy like you can make your own tail for your kite um it was when i was looking at them it was a lot cheaper to make my own so that's what i did on a grad student budget um but the the cameras are kind of hard to get around for the cost but i think if you can work with a consumer grade camera you're probably going to have a lot smaller budget than if you needed to get like a drone kind of camera. But I would say you probably can purchase the kind of cameras that you would need for a drone and then mount it on the system and it should work, um, but it will probably need a power source and things like that. Um, so you just wanna keep an eye on weight, but that's the same issue for drones. You absolutely can fly some of the small drone cameras. You are right that some of them will need an external battery pack. Yeah. So you can hook them up to a USB battery pack to fly them. Uh, they didn't exist when any of this kit was put together. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Um, so things do change. And obviously, we're getting more sophisticated with the, the imaging technology that we have access to. Like, I was putting this together for my dissertation work, you know, in the like, you know, late 2000s, you know, early 2010s. Um, so a lot of things have changed in, in terms of availability of, of the imaging uh, tech and stuff like that. So um, the thing I would just be really cautious about is how much weight you're putting on these things. Um, you can come up with a really spectacular system and then get it out in the field and then the kite can't lift it. So um, you want to keep things as lightweight as possible. And, you know, that might actually mean, you know, flying one camera at a time. If you need to, um, you might not be able to fly them both at the same time. So just, you know, think about those things and kind of be prepared. And um, as with all field work, have backup plans. Um, things happen. Like one time we flew at Malibu Lagoon and I had um, GoPro cameras, which I don't recommend because they have a fish eye on them. Um, and if 
you have a fisheye, you've got some very different optics than what a lot of the um, photogrammetry software is expecting. So anyway, but it was supposed to be taking still shots and it decided to take video instead. Um, so you can see that video on my YouTube channel. It's nauseating, but um, it is, it wasn't ideal because video is less, um, is reduced quality from the still shot. So we didn't get what we wanted, but um, it still made for an interesting YouTube video. So, you know, backup plans, I guess. We should try reprocessing that. For yeah. those who want it, there's a, some scripts I have on GitHub to flatten the GoPro images so that they're not distorted. You just lose overlap. Yeah. The big advantage to the GoPros, if, you, if you're not familiar with those cameras, they're sport cameras. They're intended for um, putting on, like strapping onto your body while you do sport things. Like you can get them for like um, waterproof ones for surfing, or you can, you know, use them for skiing or skydiving or whatever, but they're very lightweight cameras. So they're really appealing to put on a kite or a balloon because they're so lightweight. But um, because the optics are set up for these kinds of sport situations where you want a wide field of view, um, the fisheye lens is not great <laughs> for like aerial photography, um, you know, but again, we're co-opting things that were never meant to do this. So you kind of have trade-offs again, um, inexpensive lightweight camera, but maybe not um, the best optics for the situation we're working with. Um, I just remember they had an advantage, which is they have a timer mode built yeah. in. Um, too. <laughs> and there was a an aftermarket hack which we didn't try which is that you can replace the fisheye lens with a not fisheye lens yeah although i remember reading that focusing the camera correctly when you put it back together was tricky yes um and again there are companies that will modify these like i think max max at one point i don't know if they still have them but they they would modify these cameras with those those kind of specs um but just do your research and, you know, figure out like, is this a normal camera? Is this going to work for what I want? Maybe you can get sample pictures before you buy the camera um, and just kind of see what, what it looks like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically like a lot of this is a lot of research, a lot of Googling, a lot of looking at specs for different um different parts of the system and putting it all together. So um, that's why I ended up with two kites because they're kind of better for different situations. And I've got different cameras because over time I decided I want to try different things. Um, I definitely didn't start out with this plan to have this whole suite of stuff all at once. It was just kind of built up over, you know, 10 or so years of, of doing this. So um, you don't have to have all this stuff to start, but you kind of have to have the, the basics, like the kite, you need the line, you need a reel, you need safety equipment. Um, but otherwise it's just piecing things together and figuring out like, what do I need for my system? Is this actually gonna work? Do we need a different lifter? Is a drone a better option? You know, all those kinds of things. But anyway, hopefully today you kind of got an idea of how kites would work um, and, also, some of the things you might do, um, you know, with the photos you get or how to put similar systems together and things like that. So um, so anyway, I guess unless there are any other questions, I think we'll wrap this up and I'll hang on the call. I'll stop the, the video, but um, I'll hang on the call if anyone wants to ask questions after we turn this off. But thanks, everyone. I am glad you joined us today and hopefully you learned some things and um, had some fun. Got the tour of my living room with <laughs> all of my research stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone.